What's going on, everyone? I'm Travis Brown with the Eagle, and I'm here alongside Mark French, former Texas A&M guard, who uh, comes on frequently throughout the season to, to break down some of the X's and O's and what's going on with the Texas A&M men's basketball team. Mark, how's it going? Uh, how was your uh, holiday season? Hey, guys. Good morning. Um, it was great, man. It, it really was. It's uh, going to get a little break from work, uh, but back to the grind now, and I'm happy to be on with you. It's better to come on after uh, a string of wins, right, than what we were dealing with around the prior to Christmas. So uh, it's good to see you, Travis, and looking forward to this. Yeah, for sure. Um, so A and M is on a uh, four game win streak. They're three and uh, uh, three and zero in SEC play. And I think the last time we talked, it was before uh, the Christmas break. Uh, I, I think they had either just lost to Walford or just about to lose to Walford. I know one of the last things you talked about was the body language against in the loss at Boise State, and and what turned out to be not not, not one of their best performances of the year. What what looks different from you when you look at Wofford and Boise State and the way that they were playing before Christmas to the way they've been playing after Christmas. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. We're on, what, a five-game win streak now? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's Dexter Dennis and Boots finally turning it on. Um, you know, a little while back, we talked about how Boots, sometimes with a, a fourth or fifth-year player that, you know, has had a lot of success, they kind of yearn for that bigger, brighter stage. And I think as the uh, the lights have gotten brighter, Boots has played better. Um, and also Dexter. Um, I mean, you look even last night or two nights ago, you know, 13.12 rebounds. And it felt like he was everywhere on the floor on defense. And so just the, uh, I don't want to say maturation, but just kind of um, their productivity coming to fruition has been, you know, super important here. Because um, we kind of know what we're getting from Taylor and, and marble, right? We, we've talked about that before as well. But now you're starting to see the wheels turning, right? You got Dennis contributing. You kind of know what you're getting from boots now in conference play. Coleman with 10 and 10 the other night, a double-double. And then obviously Hefner coming off the bench. But, you know, from a macro perspective, that's five in a row. Um, if we're busting the season up in the mini seasons, like I've talked about, uh, you're 3-0 and in your first season in conference. Now we need to go two and one in this next one uh, where we play, you know, at Carolina versus Florida at Kentucky. Um, if you can go two and one in that stretch, that starts off conference at five and one. Uh, that gets us to that 12. I would prefer 13 is probably the magic number to guarantee you're in the tournament. Uh, 12, you're probably on the bubble. Um, but if you start off five and one in conference, that gives you a heck of a start, man. So uh, I'm really proud of them for turning it around. I think it comes down to, you know, your seniors playing like seniors. And uh, college basketball, so much of it is, you know, in this one-and-done era, how many one-and-done teams uh, that featured a lot of, you know, these five-star freshmen uh, have won the whole thing or have even gone to the Final Four, right? And so, so much of it is about having an older, mature team. Uh, and A&M has that, certainly. Um, and they're starting to play like it. Uh, definitely everything that you said uh, as part of that that turnaround. But for me, looking, it also goes into um, the, the way they've game planned. I mean, they had a great defensive game plan against Castleton. They did a really good job against uh, K.J. Williams at Florida. And beyond just a little beginning run there, they uh, really shut down uh, Kobe Brown. And that went in the game plan. Just generally speaking, what as a player in this program, what is what is scouting look like and and kind of the way that that's usually presented to players that that you think um has made this team so successful in that in that game planning area yeah so travis if you were to go out from where you do the uh, post-game press conferences and you go down the hallways and you kind of go back into the the bowels of reed arena you go into the locker room and to the right there's literally a wall it's a whole wall of a whiteboard um and prior to games, that'll be completely full, chucked full of information. Some of it you won't even talk about, but it'll be there for players prior to the game to just kind of soak in, right? And, uh, you know, eventually all that gets simplified into a couple key points. But I say all that because the staff is always going to be, you know, prepared to the utmost. Um, but you talked about it. Uh, Castleton, K.J. Williams, 
Kobe Brown. Kobe Brown, the one-time A&M commit. I remember hosting him on a, on a visit like five years ago. So weird to think about. But ends up going to Missouri. He's from Huntsville, I think. But uh, anyways, yeah, they're just super prepared. And, you know, beyond the X's and O's, Travis, I think the word that keeps coming to mind for me is aggression, right? It's not even an intensity. Yes, it's the intensity in which they play with, but it's imposing their will on the other team right now, especially on the defensive end of the floor, but also on the offensive end of the floor. Um, we're dictating. And uh, I shared with someone um, a day or two ago, uh, prior to the national championship game on Monday, Molly McGrath was asking Kirby Smart, you know, what's the, the theme for your team? And uh, I was sitting there with one of my buddies. Uh, he actually went to Bama, right? His name's Jake. And a uh, big football fan. And he said, yeah, Kirby, his one word ever since he's been at Bama, it's aggression. He said, watch, he'll say aggression. Sure enough, his response, aggression, you know? <laughs> and I was, I was thinking about it. And I was like, A&M, to some degree, A&M basketball needs to play like a football team. Uh, the best Buzz Williams teams, uh, throughout his tenure at three or four different stops have always played with this fierce aggression. And I think this team's getting to that point where what's the one word to describe Texas a and basketball? Aggression. And uh, the SEC network people were comparing us to, uh, you know, uh, uh, the former boxer. Uh, we're kind of like a that old style boxer just kind of keeps giving you blows to the body. Um, and, you know, if they can keep doing that, the game plans will be in place, but for me, it's about the psyche of the team to execute that game plan. Um, and they've done that so far through three games, through three games, and now they got to regroup and do it again. Be two and one in this next stretch. Yeah, for sure. It, it does seem like um, that aggression really kicked in uh, when, once SEC play started. It's it's uh, it's something that that I think when you talk about. It, interconnectedness to that that body language at Boise State. I mean, when they came out uh, in the second half of the, well, I think the Northwestern State game, uh, it just seemed like something clicked, and they've 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 moved on from there in that body language and confidence, and that's led to uh, uh, aggression. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. I think they've turned a corner. Um, it stinks because I feel like right now they're in the top probably quarter of the SEC in terms of teams I would not want to play right now if I was an opponent. Um, it just stinks because you look at it you're like, man, if we could have just got one of those Wofford or, uh, um, you know, maybe like a Murray State, um, you know, just Boise State, one of those three, it's like, man, the seeding come March could be so much better. But sometimes you got to go through those things uh, – for the coaching staff to kind of realize what they have or the players to realize what they got to do. Um, and so I think they've kind of bu bust through to an extent, but I want to be cautious here. I think if you're A&M, do not get caught up in the headlines. Now is not the time to read press clippings. Now is the time to uh, really recalibrate and get really amped up to go to South Carolina and execute a, a game plan uh, because that's going to be a rowdy crowd. They just beat Kentucky. We all know that. Uh, students will be coming back. It'll be a Saturday night in Columbia. Um, a and M better better be ready to play. Yeah. One more question before we look ahead. So the other part about this that's intrigued me is the fact that uh, Buzz Williams and his staff have really tightened the rotation. Um, you know, early in the season, a lot of guys were getting minutes. They were trying to find things that stuck. And it seems like over the last couple of games, they found their guys and beyond just the starters and the guys that have um, really kind of congealed there going to Andre Gordon and to uh, Anderson Garcia off the bench to kind of be that defensive spark. Um, you look at some of their deeper anal analytics and both Garcia and Gordon have been excellent at what their role is just how that, that grouping, how those groupings, how the rotation is tightened and how that seemed to have, have helped things moving forward. Yeah, no doubt. I think tight rotations are good. I think sometimes coaches get too spread out, to be honest with you. So A&M, we're down to nine players that are going to play, right, the rest of the year, in my opinion. Um, Marble, Coleman, Taylor, Dennis, Radford, listen to this. 23 minutes, 35, 29, 36, 38 minutes for Boots. Um, that's the recipe, right? The only guy in double-digit uh, minutes off the bench was Hefner, and part of that was because he was so darn productive. Uh, three or three from three the other night, 12 points. 
But there's this trend, right? That, that's just a one-game sample, but it's a trend over the last four to five games of this tightening in the rotation. And I think, look, you got guys that are well-conditioned. you got older, mature players that have been through the rigors of conference play. And the reality is you got to have your best players on the floor in this league. There's too much talent, too much high-end talent in this league to not play your best guys the most minutes. And, uh, yeah, I think they're done tinkering with the lineups. I think, you know, Marble Coleman, Taylor, Dennis, Radford, uh, Solo is going to mix in. Remember, Solo is that X fa- – not X factor. He's a wild card, right? If he, if he pops somewhere along conference play and it clicks for him, he could, he could earn some more minutes. But in terms of Garcia and Gordon, I think you're going to see him in that five to ten minute range. Um, and then Hefner uh, is a shooter that, you know, if, he, if he's hitting, they're going to play him. If he's not, they'll probably pull him because there's some guys that are better on defense. But – uh, I'm a huge fan of a tight rotation. Uh, I think, you know, my senior year, it got down to where there were seven or eight guys playing at the end of the year. Um, if you look at last year, kind of the same thing. I think they got down to eight or nine. Um, and you need that. You need your best guys playing the most minutes. And the reality is this is in the NBA. You're not playing 82 games. You're playing, you know, 18 conference games and you've only played twice a week. So if you take care of your body and you're getting sleep, you should be able to do it. And, uh, so far it's working for them. Yeah, for sure. Um, Solomon Washington, great defender. Uh, he did a good job against Kobe Brown uh, in in that time. They were doing the offense defense sub thing with their at, there at the end of the game. Uh, he he he's come along as a defender. Just needs to foul a little bit less. Yeah, no doubt. And so here's the thing with Solo, right? It's kind of like uh, I'm trying to think of a comp. So like Rob Williams, but on a lesser level. So like mm-hmm. even if he's on the floor and he only had one block, but it felt like he affected like five, six, seven, eight shots, right? Mm -hmm. And so his length, his explosiveness to be able to contest shots at their high point um, and then, you know, rotate on the back end of the corner or be at the rim during the scuffle to kind of, you know, if there's four or five guys in there and it just seems like his body being in the mix is a net positive for A&M, right? And so he knows his role. He didn't even take a shot the other night against Mizzou, one or two from the free throw line, a couple rebounds and assists and a block. But it just seems like he's understanding his role and he's accepted that. Um, and that's really big development for A&M. Because a kid that talented, he could be frustrated right now. But on the flip side, he's bought in. And that's a credit to Buzz and the rest of the staff for, um, you know, getting that buy-in. Mm-hmm. So uh, moving forward, South Carolina, uh, Florida, and Kentucky. Um, South Carolina, the lowest net, but a team that beat Kentucky. Uh, Florida, your first mirror game. And then Kentucky, a team that seems to be falling like a like a stone uh, right now. How, yeah. it seems three winnable games. Um, seems like a like you said, it's a pretty important stretch uh, moving forward because this schedule is is back heavy. Schedule is very back heavy. I mean, there's a stretch in here, Travis, where you go. I mean, listen to this five game stretch later in the year, starting on the February seventh, verse number twenty one Auburn, at LSU. Verse number 15, Arkansas, at number 20, Missouri, verse number five, Tennessee. And so, you know, you start looking at it and it's like, dang, we have a stretch here where it's at Carolina, Florida, at Kentucky, like you mentioned. And then we go to Auburn, but then we go Vandy at Arkansas versus Georgia. And so you kind of, if you were to break the, the conference slate in half, you probably have to be seven and two, six and three at worst in this first nine to set yourself up for the back nine. The flip side of that is you're going to have some opportunities for some really big wins, uh, which they will need in order to improve seating and have a shot at making the tournament. Um, yeah, this is, I mean, this next three games will tell us, you know, whether we're going to make the tournament or not. They have to be two and one and three and one would be just excellent. Start off six and oh, right. Um, two and one at a minimum, if we're talking about making the tournament. Yeah. We, we mentioned Florida, that first mayor game, um, as yeah. a player from scouting, uh, one of the more, what Buzz Williams said, one of the more challenging parts about the season is, is going up against a team in Florida. That's a, that's a quick turnaround between the two. Um, fr- from your experience, what does that scouting look like and how difficult are those mirror games, especially when they're so close to, together? Well, I think the big thing is as a player, you remember a lot of the scouts especially if it's that close together, you'd be like, oh yeah, I kind of remember those plays. And then they probably introduced 
you know, one to two more wrinkles and what they're doing. So you add that. So you kind of know what to expect, I guess. Um, but when you play the team that close, you know, they're coming out. If you got to put yourself in their shoes saying, okay, we let that one slip away at home. Let's get even. And so if you're A&M, you have to come out uh, with a strong start um, and find a way to jump out early on them and show that you've improved since four games ago. Um, so I don't think it's that challenging in terms of, you know, scouting and, and turnaround like that. I think it's more just about players showing short-term growth um, and having a maturity to be consistent. Uh, so I think they'll be fine. Castleton's a great player. Um, you know, from an A&M perspective, I think we need, our crowds need to be better. Uh, I think you, you've seen some decent ones lately. But as this team continues to go and as they keep winning, um, you know, I'd love to see, you know, some bigger crowds and everyone getting pretty raucous because, you know, it makes a huge difference. And, uh, you know, long term, I hope we build a new arena. But short term, you know, with Reed, it's a big, you know, 14, 15,000 seat arena or whatever it is. Let's pack that thing in and, and make it an environment that, uh, you know, is conducive to helping the Aggies. So in that next three game stretch, let's go. The, the, the A&M will be successful. Yeah. They'll gather some wins in that next three game stretch if blank. Dexter Dennis continues to emerge. Because I think right now, last time we spoke, I wasn't sure what was going on with Boots prior to Christmas. Uh, but as the state, you know, as the lights have gotten brighter, he seems to have really come on, right? And so I, I kind of, let's go down the list, right? Wade Taylor, check. I know what I'm getting. Tyrese Radford now, check. I know what I'm getting. Julius Marble has been an absolute revelation. Check. I know what I'm getting. Henry Coleman, still kind of up and down, a little inconsistent, but another guy, Bright's a little bit brighter. He seems to come alive. Dexter Dennis is the one piece that could change a and season from being a borderline tournament team that has to go back to the NIT to being like an eight or nine seed that wins a game or two in March. And him shooting the ball with confidence. He shot 11 times the other night. It was the most on the team. I was actually glad. I want him to have no hesitation. Uh, he was three and nine from three. I'll take it. Because his confidence that he exudes when he's playing like that rubs off on other guys. Also think in the pecking order, everything just kind of falls into place. It lessens the load on uh, Wade. Uh, Boots seems to be a little bit more effective when the defense isn't completely, um, you know, synced up and loaded to him as he's driving downhill. Um, Dexter's done an unbelievable job. He's getting to the baseline, a lot of up and under finishes, corner threes, wing threes, playing off of Wade and Tyrese's drives. And so the reason I say that Dexter, in my opinion, is the uh, X factor to A&M playing well is that it opens up another dimension of the offense. Not only do we become um, strictly hard drivers to the lane that are going to lead the country in free throws, um, you know, attempted, we also have this dynamic of if you are going to sat, uh, you know, like pound the paint and the defense is going to load up on that, we can spray it to the corner in the wings and be able to hit some threes. And so I think Dexter Dennis, look, if he can average – 10 plus points and five plus rebounds. AM's and going to have a great shot to be in that upper quarter of the SEC. Yeah. When it go back to the LSU game, I mean, he entered that game as the worst free throw, uh, or for, excuse me, throws worst field goal percentage at the rim. And then all of a sudden he was coming in with monster dunks and, and uh, up and under layups, like you said, and was finishing all of them went four for four. We're really a breakout game. And he's been, he's been nails ever since. Yeah, that, I think that fast break dunk that ended up on Sports Center or whatever, uh, I think he needed that. Mm -hmm. There's something about a, a, a player's psychological like disposition almost when you just get that one play where it's like you get to release all that energy, let out a scream, and be like, I've been waiting all season for that moment, and then it clicks. And for the rest of the season, they're good. It's, the, it's one of the, the strangest things about basketball is it's literally just a confidence sport. So much of it is like a lot of these guys are skilled, Travis, but it's just like the confidence in which they play with is different. And that alters the result. And I think Dexter's confidence has just continued to blossom. And his play is a trailing indicator of that. It's following that confidence. And uh, I'm really excited for him. And I'm excited for the, you know, the, the team because it's a, it's a big development.
for sure. Mark, thanks so much for giving us again a few minutes of your time and glad to get we'll get a, a, a more steady uh, rotation of you getting in here to break down as they continue through the SEC slate. Two and one in the next three, guys. Let's get it done. Gig them. See you, Travis.